some of this is what we would call imagination, um, and, it, and it goes very deep. That um, the table, uh, you, you think of the table where Jesus meets the disciples, or lots of places where Jesus is sitting at table and eating and conversation, that, that this is the shift of imagination because my observation would be that many, many leaders are still thinking about pew or building, um, gathering place as the primary metaphor within which they're working, uh, whereas the table is in the home in the neighborhood, in the community. So that's the big shift. But the other thing I would observe, Mark, is that even as we talk about this with a lot of pastors, they, they, their eyes light up and they have a lot of energy around this. But, but we'll come back and say things like, I get that, but I, I have no practical idea or uh, I feel uh, already overwhelmed in trying to manage and look after uh, the needs of the people and the demands of the people in my congregation, that I have no time left to do this sort of thing, or a sense of them saying, I just feel isolated where I am uh, and, and not knowing where I can connect with others to go on that journey. So these are some of the other things that are shaping uh, people's responses to what we're talking about. I, I don't know what your observation would be on. You know, it reminds me in, in our Doctor of Ministries courses that we taught together, um, in the midst of obviously brilliant lectures and all the other wonderful things we did, most of the time the single most important step was the year in which we say pastors needed to spend 20% of their time in their communities, either near their church, near their home, but without their collar. No official status, simply be a neighbor among neighbors. And after their faces went white and then fears about talking with church boards beyond that, um, most of the time it was that next six months um, in the midst of other practices, lectio, examine, prayer, prayerful conversations, that it's pretty hard to discern what God might be doing in the neighborhood unless you're in the neighborhood. Um, one of our favorite educators of the middle of the last century, Henrietta Mears, would say you can't steer a parked car. And so if we're going to be participating in identifying seeing God, then it's really important to be out in out there. And consistently, as we've worked with clusters of churches, as they started doing that, and then the other critical issue of sharing those stories, both inside the the, among the particular congregation, but then between congregations. Um, the confidence, the faithfulness builds, the capacity to see builds, the capacity to know how to listen builds, which is huge. Um, so instead of just listening, as churches often do, what are the needs of this community and how do we solve them? Instead, listening underneath that, what are the emotions in the community? What are the fears? What are the anxieties? What are the loves? What are the passions? What are the desires? And it's a whole different um, type of listening than, again, what empowered, especially as a, as a white male, what do empowered white males do to fix the neighborhood? Um, and unless I break those habits and come in with a very different posture, um, I can't increase my capacity to recognize God who doesn't tend to act <coughs> in the way that my habits have shaped me. Um, and so it just flips the whole process. Yeah, and I think, I think it's really important to put a big, thick underline uh, about what you're saying is that in this work of discerning the spirit out ahead of us, if we as leaders, as pastors, are not in our own communities, in our own contexts, if we're not learning how to do this around tables where we live, um, we're probably not going to be able to simply speak and say to people, in our congregation says what you need to do. So that that leading by being present and ahead is just critically important to our own discernment and our own modeling of people. 